Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Dov Weinman. I'm the executive director of the Middle Fork Willamette Watershed Council. Um, we're really happy to host you tonight for our webinar, uh, What Time Will Tell, Monitoring Over Time at Elijah Bristow State Park. Um, so you'll notice that you're muted, um, but if you have questions during the presentation, um, you can type them into the Q&A box. Um, you might be able to use the chat and put them there as well. Um, so we just want to let people know that we're going to try to answer questions after the presentation tonight. Um, and we also have um, Gail Darling and Kavoka Jackson, um, also two council staff. Uh, Gail Darling's our community engagement coordinator and Kavoka Jackson's our restoration projects manager. And they'll be available to answer some of the questions that are put in the Q&A during the presentation as well. Um, so we'll hold questions until the end, and I also just wanted to let folks know that this is being recorded um, and it'll be available later on um, with captions uh, on YouTube for folks that want to view it later. Um, just a little bit about our council. Um, so the mission at the Middle Fork Land Watershed Council is to work with communities towards a healthy Middle Fork Land watershed through both environmental education and habitat restoration. Um, our education program helps both youth and adults. Um, we're looking to deepen um, a greater sense of place and also under help folks understand how they can have um, more positive impacts as landscape stewards. Uh, our restoration projects uh, stretch along Highway 58. Um, they go from Springville towards north of Oak Ridge and support a bunch of different um, wildlife and, and fish species. Um, and some of that we'll actually get to talk about and learn about tonight. Um, so I'll introduce our speaker next. Uh, Matthew Culver is a project biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Native Fish Investigations Program in the Oregon Chub Monitoring Project. He's worked for OD ODFNW since 2013, filling a number of different roles and positions and gaining fishery science experience throughout the state of Oregon. He pursued this field of work because of his curiosity and love of all things outdoors. His professional interests include ecosystem ecology, fisheries management, native fish conservation, among other things. His current position focuses on Oregon chub research and recovery and allows him the opportunity to study and observe many other species using backwater and off-channel habitats in the Willamette River Basin, including fish, amphibians, mammals, and aquatic vegetation. When he's not working, Matthew can often be found fishing, hunting, and recreating on the land and water that he works diligently to preserve and protect. Um, so I think um, enough from me, Matthew. If you're ready, um, we'll go ahead and let you um, start your presentation. Thank you, Dov. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're good, Matthew. Thank okay. you. All right. All right. I'll go ahead and go straight into the, uh, the presentation here. Um, Let's see here. Of course, when I get in front of people, I'm going to lose all sense of what I'm doing. All right, so we're into the PowerPoint. Um, I think everybody can hear me. Let me know if something is not working out. Um, again, my name is Matthew Culver. I work for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I work under the Native Fish Investigations Program but more specifically, I work on the Oregon Chub Monitoring Project. Uh, it's a project that's been a long, around for a long time, over 30 years. Um, I'll go ahead and move forward and introduce the species and everything. But um, professionally, as, as you stated, Dov, I've been working with the agency since 2013. I've had uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of seasonal roles, um, moved around the state and worked on a lot of projects. And then basically since 2017, I've been in some way involved in the Oregon Chub Monitoring Project. And, and again, currently I'm the project lead. So goals for the presentation, I'll uh, go over right off the bat. I'm gonna do this a little different be, than I would if I was in front of a group of people. I'm gonna have more text and um, I wanna make sure you guys can follow along via text. Um, so I'll be reading off the slides some, I apologize for that. Uh, but first of all, I wanna introduce Oregon Chub and the Oregon Chub Project which includes uh, introducing a timeline 
Uh, again, our project goes way back. I won't be presenting data from way, way back um, because I wanted to present some annual data from the Elijah Bristow area, uh, which we have not been sampling annually for since the beginning of, of the project. Um, so it'll be a little bit tighter time frame, but I'll get to that. Uh, the scope of the project, so including, you know, like the, the, um, the area that we are currently monitoring with a focus on the Elijah Bristow and the Middle Fork Willamette. And then also the current status of Oregon chub to date. Then I'm going to move on a little bit more to other fish species that are present in the Willamette River. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about natives versus non-natives. And I want to talk about habitat and how that affects those fish. I'm going to talk about dams a little bit. Uh, most of the tributaries of the Willamette uh, are affected by dams, uh, specifically the Middle Fork Willamette that we're going to talk about mostly uh, is. And um, the Elijah Bristow area, you know, is basically connected to one of those dams. So there's no, uh, no way to talk about the habitats that are below a dam without mentioning that there's a dam there. Uh, again, Elijah Bristow is going to be sort of my focus area that I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to hone in on a, on a few populations of Oregon chub and talk about the fish assemblage and the fish community that shares those, those, those habitats. And then I kind of want to talk about bigger picture. And this is where I'm going to sort of make a little bit of a pitch for um, habitat restoration. So Oregon chub, uh, again, that's, that's my focus species. That's the reason that I have my current position. Um, they, uh, let's see here, a little bit of background on Oregon chub. Prior to 1970s, and I would even say clear up until the 1990s, um, there was not a lot of attention being put on Oregon chub. Um, they're just a small minnow species that was often just ignored. Uh, most of the data that we have on them from, from the past, from I would say pre-1990, was a lot of like uh, bycatch data. It wasn't necessarily folks out that were doing research specifically on them. They're the only fish that are endemic to the Willamette River Basin, which means it's the only place in the world that they exist naturally, which is pretty cool. I consider these, you know, um, Oregon's fish or, you know, the Willamette River fish. Um, they are also the first fish that had been delisted from the ESA, and that was due to recovery. That was in 2015. So that was huge news. There were a couple of species shortly after that were delisted, but they were the first. So uh, they definitely have a spot in history for that purpose. And the reason I still have a job is because we are still currently monitoring Oregon chub. There's a nine-year post-delisting uh, monitoring time frame, um, and I will move on and talk a little bit more about that in the time frame. Oh, before I do so. I want to uh, show you guys kind of the, this is a video that was put out by Freshwaters Illustrated. Uh, this is, uh, let's go ahead and play it. This is a good representative of the habitat that you can find Oregon chub in. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot more about habitat and off-channel habitats. Um, basically those are slow moving, slow moving water habitats that are away from the main channels of rivers generally. Um, they don't have to be very far offset, but they generally are, you know, off of, off of the main channel. Uh, they typically have a lot of this aquatic vegetation you'll notice in the background. Oregon chub and a lot of these minnow species or off-channel habitat species are obligate to that. They need this, this, this vegetated area. They need slow moving water. They depend on it for multiple life histories. Um, you know, they're not necessarily the strongest swimmers. They also need it for uh, spawning purposes and protection from predators, all kinds of different things. So it's just, it's super necessary. And so I think that video does a pretty good job of showing that. Uh, moving on, um, I want to give you guys a little bit more background on historic distribution and distribution prior to them being listed in 1993. This just sets the stage. Um, like I said before, there weren't a lot of people who were out specifically monitoring for Oregon chub. Um, the records that I have here, this image on the left, there's two maps. The one on the left is historic distribution. This is basically us digging into a whole bunch of uh, historic information, um, accounts of Oregon chub, uh, 
nobody was really out looking, but they were bycatch and they were just basically noted in somebody's journal somewhere. And this is what we came up with. So overall, it shows a, a pretty well distributed species, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, moving forward, um, we did a bunch of surveying in the late 80s, early 90s. And that's when we really realized there was an issue. Uh, the map on the right is from 1991. At this point, we realized, you know, there are not a lot of chub out here. We had only identified eight populations at that point. Um, for those of you who are, who are, are Middle Fork Willamette proponents, which I imagine everybody is, the neat news is that six of these populations were actually in the Middle Fork Willamette. So that was like a real source population for us. Um, there were also, there was a population in San Diego, which is listed here. I think you guys can see my cursor. And then a population that was actually an introduction um, on the long tom. But yeah, takeaway, we were down to eight populations, um, none of which were really in very good shape. So what happened? Why, why did we end up with this crazy reduction in, in chub populations? both density or uh, distribution and abundance. Um, reason mainly um, is what you see in the background. Uh, there's a few other reasons as well, but uh, people caused things. So dams were built and dams began being constructed. This is actually a photo in the background of Dexter Dam. So this is the most applicable dam that we'll be talking about. I believe it was uh, constructed, started in the mid forties and finished in uh, the mid fifties. Um, they, you know, as dams were constructed for flood control, water supply, um, power and recreation, there's, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of good things that dams have done. So I'm not going to be here hating on dams, but they definitely do affect fish, both upstream and downstream and, um, and, and, and the habitats that those fish were using. So in addition to dams, uh, there was also agriculture things going on, cities were being built. Uh, I mean, dams definitely play into all of this, um, but, you know, there was channelization happening, dikes and revetments were being built in agricultural areas and cities, draining the wetlands for, for cities or for housing developments. Um, a lot of different things were happening, which was um, reducing the amount of available habitat and or doing damage to, to, to the, 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 the ecosystems that these fish were living in. Ultimately, all of this contributed to a loss of historic flow regimes um, that are responsible for the creation of floodplain habitats, these preferred floodplain habitats that these fish needed. Then another thing that happened was the introduction of non-native fish. So, uh, you know, infrastructure was built, um, agriculture, cities, all kinds of things were changing. The water, waterways were changing. We were seeing a huge reduction in shoreline, available shoreline and, and off-channel habitats. And then these non-native fish were actually moving into the system as well, both through introductions, you know, many different ways these guys were being introduced. Um, but ultimately they were predating upon or they were competing with our native floodplain fish. They still are. And so that's uh, another probably big reason that Oregon chub got greatly reduced. I'm gonna run through a little bit of the history of Oregon Chub and the Oregon Chub project. <clears throat> um, again, they were ESA listed. Uh, this didn't happen until 1993, and that was following a petition that was put out in 1990. Uh, in between that, there was a there was a conservation agreement um, between multiple agencies that sort of laid the foundation of the planning for the conservation of Oregon Chub. And so we were operating off of that for some time. In 1998, the recovery plan came about, and really, it's it was a lot of the same ideas. Um, although, you know, in the meantime, from 92 to 98, there was a lot of studies going on. We were learning a lot about the, the life history of Oregon chub, um, and we were there was already a lot of work going on. Um, so ultimately, the species was downlisted in 2010 and then delisted from the ESA due to recovery again um, in 2015. So awesome, huge, huge accomplishment. Um, I'm really proud to be a part of this project. Uh, 
I think that we've done some pretty awesome things. I haven't been here for throughout the entire project. I've only really seen the, the tail end of it, but uh, it's pretty amazing what, what's been done. Currently we're in the post listing monitoring and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a layout for that. So we're moving into the 2022 year and the post delisting monitoring plan is laid out like this. It's spread out across, uh, well, we break the entire Willamette up into three recovery areas. One being the Saniam, one being the Middle Fork Willamette. And then the other is sort of an all encompassing, we call it the main stem Willamette. Um, it's basically everything else other than the Saniam and the Middle Fork Willamette. Reason being that the Saniam and the Middle Fork were sort of our initial uh, basins that had a lot of orchid chub populations. Um, we thought that was going to be the majority of our, of our effort that was going to be going in as far as monitoring the fish. Well, the good news is that we ended up finding orchid chub in quite a few other places. And then in turn, we, you know, we, we bolstered those numbers and overall, um, they're pretty widespread now. But yeah, we're moving into year eight of nine. It's a nine year plan. Um, in year eight, we'll be looking at the main stem populations or the main stem recovery area. And then our potentially last year will be uh, 2023, and we'll be looking at the Middle Fork Willamette. So another thing written into the post listing monitoring plan, in addition to just the schedule, um, is that it does lay out a number of criteria that must be met for Oregon Chub to maintain their status as, as not needing protection from the ESA. And I'm just going to go over those real quick. I don't know if everybody can see this, so I want to say it aloud, but um, these are kind of sort of dumbed down in a way. Um, so, so if you have questions about any of these, feel free to ask later on in the talk. Um, in order for Oregon Chub to, to maintain their status as not needing protection, there has to be 25 populations greater than or equal to 500 fish. Also, uh, we have to have five of those in each of the three recovery areas, so the Saniam, Middle Fork Willamette, and Main Stem Willamette. Also included in the criteria is that less than 80% of Oregon Chub sites have non-native. Um, that's sort of a general term. It doesn't necessarily say non-native fish, but non-natives. Less than 30% of the Chub sites have new non-natives. And I'll just tell you right now, they're Hasn't been many new non-natives that have come about since 2015. Um, there has been one specific, uh, specifically a fish that has come around. Its numbers are still really low, um, but we're closely monitoring that. That's the green sunfish, in case anybody was gonna ask me later. Um, there's been, there also has to be no significant loss of habitat due to reservoir drawdowns. At least 50% of the habitat within the sub-basins must maintain sufficient chub habitat. And a 50-year uh, interval flood doesn't significantly negatively impact Oregon chub habitats. So I know those are kind of broad and there's not a lot of detail there. So um, feel free to ask questions later if you'd like. Here, uh, we're showing the distribution of Oregon chub sort of to date. This only goes through 2020. I'm sorry, I didn't include a lot of 2020 data and I didn't update some of my maps for 2021, even though we, we have completed that field season. Um, I will tell you that this distribution map didn't change much. Um, it's still a good representative of where Oregon Chub can be found. Um, this is the Willamette River Basin. And you'll see a lot of maps that look like this throughout the talk. Um, labeled in red is actually introductions that we've made through the years. And I'll give a little more detail on that. That was a pretty significant portion of our project early on. And then in green, um, we have naturally occurring populations. So pretty significant um, increases in distribution and abundance of Oregon chub since the early days. I showed you that picture uh, from the 1991 earlier, there was only eight populations. We're doing pretty good and we're pretty widespread throughout the basin. So what have we done and how did we get here? Um, again, introductions were a really important part of the project. We still make introductions. This is, I talk about it as if it was something that was more important early and it may have been more important early, um, but we still put some emphasis on that. And, and, and when there are adequate opportunities, we still are making introductions for Oregon Chubb. 
there's been a little bit of a shift though. So early on, because there were so few Oregon shell populations known, and they, um, you know, especially when we found them, for instance, when we knew, we only knew there was one population in the San EM, there was good reason for us to be worried that, that that population could just bleep out, right? So the idea behind the introductions was to find isolated um, habitats, find and or create isolated habitats, I should say, because there's been a lot of effort in creating habitats for organ shove as well. Um, we would remove small numbers of fish from naturally occurring areas, and naturally occurring populations, and we'd make introductions. Um, and what this did is it, it gave Oregon Shelb a place where they could basically thrive away from the threats of, of competition and predation. And um, it, was, it was hugely successful. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward, but uh, it really contributed hugely to the success of the, of the program, especially early on. We did a lot of research on life history. Uh, you know, there's no sense in, in, in trying to recover a species that you don't know anything about. So we were, you know, doing a bunch of studies on spawning timing, on growth rate, on all kinds of stuff that we thought might be pertinent to the management of the species. There were also movement studies and genetic investigations early on in the project. Um, told us a lot of stuff. Uh, we learned, we learned that, um, you know, let me, let me preface to that. We originally thought that Oregon shell, because they're a relatively like, you know, weak, slow swimmer, we thought that they would have a hard time distributing through, throughout uh, the basin and that they were maybe isolated in those certain areas um, without sort of intervention and, and spreading them out. Well, our, our movement study showed us that, that, that Oregon chub actually could move from site to site. Um, they could move uh, throughout the main stem habitats. They generally wouldn't stay there long, but they would, they would move from one off-channel habitat to another. Um, and there's multiple instances where we, we, uh, we actually saw that movement multiple miles sometimes between habitats moving through the main stem. Our genetic investigations also told us that while each basin does, does have genetically distinct organ chub, genetically distinct fish, um, there is some mixing. Um, and especially as you're heading downstream, probably, there's a little bit more genetic uh, consistency or less, less uh, I'm at a loss of words here. Uh, the takeaway is that uh, each basin has genetically distinct fish. Um, we did research on habitat and populations throughout the entire thing. I would say this is the, the meat and potatoes of the project. This is how we determine whether or not Oregon Chub are meeting those criteria that I mentioned before. So we've been out just keeping a really close eye on things. We've been watching populations, we've been doing population estimates, um, and also monitoring the habitats that these fish are living in. So these, this, is, this is directed by both the recovery plan and then also um, there was an additional study that came along called the floodplain study. The sites that I'm gonna talk about today um, are actually a part of the floodplain study where we're looking at more than just Oregon chub. We're also looking at the full fish community in some places and we're trying to determine how those communities are changing uh, relative to the management of dams. So flow and temperature monitoring became a, a part of that. Uh, the sites that I'm going to talk about today, we, we have been monitoring those things. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Um, I'm just going to mainly talk about fish. Not a lot of explanation as to why exactly things are happening, but I'm going to, you know, show you what, what the fish communities look like and how they've been changing over time. Uh, there's been habitat improvement projects that have happened throughout the project, um, both on introduction sites and on naturally occurring sites. Um, to, to better the habitat for Oregon chub in places that they are either already existing or to better habitats where we anticipate that Oregon chub could, could spread to. Um, and so basically we're just trying to improve those habitats and give chub a fighting chance. And then throughout the years, we have maintained uh, a high level of exploratory surveys, like a lot of effort has gone into this. So not only have we made a bunch of introductions, which has been huge for bolstering Oregon chub populations. But through these uh, uh, continuous efforts, we've continued to find more and more chub populations that are naturally occurring. 
So overall, where we were in 1991, just a quick comparison. This is two years prior to the ESA listing of the species. There were eight known populations. Uh, none of them were what we considered large populations being over 500 fish. Six of eight, eight of these were in the Middle Fork Willamette, which again is pretty cool since we're, this is a Middle Fork Willamette talk. Uh, seven of these were naturally occurring and one was introduced. And then where we are now, this is 28 years post ESA listing, so post 1993. We've currently got 131 known populations of Oregon chub throughout the, river, the Willamette River Basin. 41 of these are greater than or equal to 500 adult fish. 42 known populations in the Middle Fork Willamette. So that's pretty cool. Again, we went from six to 42 in the Middle Fork Willamette. And of the 131 known populations, 31 of these are introduction sites. So this kind of shows the same thing. Um, this is a histogram showing the growth of, of um, of organ chub populations over time. Um, on the x-axis, we have years. And then on the y-axis, we're just showing the number of populations. Again, in 2021, we're at 131. And of interest, this is kind of cool, 33% of these um, have actually come about since 2015, the year of the delisting. So, you know, chub were on an upwards trend and they've continued to be on an upwards trend. And so um, overall, you know, we don't have a ton of worry about the species. We're still doing the monitoring. There are some worries, but overall, Oregon chub seem to be doing pretty well. So this is where I'm gonna kind of wrap up the Oregon chub stuff specific. And before I did, I just wanted to uh, call out the folks who were so incremental in, in, um, in the efforts that have been taking place over the last more than 20 years and who are responsible for the recovery of Oregon chub. So as I state here, there's a lot more than just what I have listed, um, including watershed councils and water, water and, and uh, soil conservation districts and tons of private landowners. There's just a lot of folks out there who have had a hand in this or are responsible for, for the success of Oregon chub. So uh, this is where I wanna talk about what makes us different from other research groups that are out there. So the biggest thing is, is that while the majority of research going on within the state, with even within the Pacific Northwest in general, most of the fish work that you're gonna hear about is salmon centric, right? It's talking a lot about salmon. And don't get me wrong, I'm a fisherman, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a native Pacific Northwesterner. Um, I've got a lot of love for salmon. However, I think it's really important that people get to, to, to know that, you know, there's a lot of other fish out there. There's actually 69 fish species in the Willamette River Basin. I think most people don't have a clue that, that that's the number. Of those, a little over half are native, and then almost half of those are non-native fish. That's kind of a scary statistic in my opinion. So um, we are keeping an eye on all of those other fish, stuff other than salmon. We do get a little bit, bit of bycatch as far as juvenile salmon. So we, we do see some salmonids, some trout, um, but we're looking at the other fish that are really utilizing those, those off-channel, uh, slow, slow moving water type habitats. So I'll int start introducing you to some of those. I would love to go through and talk about uh, every species individually, although I don't think uh, it, would, it would be uh, time efficient. So um, overall, uh, to, to wrap it up into a little tighter envelope here, uh, minnows, which is Oregon chub, um, there's eight different species in the Willamette, um, all of which are native fish. Um, we've also got sculpins. At this point, I'm, I, I think this is an up-to-date uh, number. Um, there's been a lot of genetic work on sculpin, so they continue to kind of learn more and they've been splitting some of these. And, and um, But I think at, to date, we're sitting at seven different species of sculpin in the Willamette, three different species of lamprey, two species of suckers. We've got sturgeon. Sturgeon do get quite a bit of attention, so don't get me wrong, um, but I figured I'd mention them here. I labeled this as, um, native non-salmonid species by number. 
Uh, but moving forward, you'll see I do kind of include some salmonids. Uh, stickleback is another species. This is a three-span stickleback. This is one that you find in the Willamette as well. Trout perch, um, you've also probably heard of this. Some of you may have heard of this as a sand roller. Uh, moving forward, I will refer it to it as a sand roller. And then these are the other ones that, even though I say non-salmonids, these are technically salmonids. The difference being that these are these are uh, non-anadromous fish um, that do not migrate to the ocean and live out their life and then, and then come back to spawn. Um, but there are also ones, I, would, I included them because I think they don't get a lot of attention. Bull trout, maybe. Uh, here's some of the fish that I, I do want to talk about. Uh, specifically, um, on the upper upper left, we've got a chiselmouth minnow. Uh, on the top right, we have a sand roller. Below that, it's a red-sided shiner. And then below that is, on the, on the far bottom right, is a three-spined stickleback. And then that big boy on the bottom left is a species of sculpin. So again, I think these are species that just don't get a lot of attention. A lot of people really, unless you're in this field of interest, you're probably not hearing about them. You're not, not learning a lot about them. These here are all natives. Um, but again, there's, you know, these are just a few of them. There's 36 native species, four of which are salmonids, and then 33 non-native fish that are, are inhabiting and using the Willamette River as well. So, I'm gonna use this as sort of a transition where I'm gonna start talking about habitat needs. And so I included th these species specifically because I wanna point out the fact that, you know, all species need something a little different. So for instance, chiselmouth, they exist in faster water. They prefer sort of fast cobble type habitats, pretty similar to like what you would expect to catch trout or salmon or steelhead in, in the main stem. Um, sand rollers, they're a nocturnal fish. Uh, during daylight, daylight hours anyways, you're really only gonna find them like under undercut banks or in root wads, places where there's lots of cover. Red-sided shiners below them, like slower open water. They're a visual feeder. They like to get out in the open waters, um, but they're, they're, they're not really ideally suited for the fast water habitats. Um, we've got stickleback on the lower right. They're like Oregon chub, where they really like a lot of vegetation. They're gonna be tucked into weeds and uh, again, they can exist in, in pretty slow moving, pretty swampy type habitats. Uh, that's their preference. And then you have sculpin, which again, there's multiple species of sculpin, um, but sort of lumping them all, I would say they're very diverse in the type of habitat that they can exist in. So I say here, they pretty much exist everywhere. We catch them everywhere. So what do we want? What do fish want? This is kind of like, this is the crux of the talk for me. Well, fish like complex habitats. If you're going to have a, a diverse assemblage of fish, if you're going to have a lot of different species, you need to have habitat complexity because all of them are going to require something different. So this is a stock photo. Somebody here may actually know what this is. I believe it is the Willamette. Uh, I was searching the Willamette when I found it. Um, but what this is showing, I, I believe this is a restoration site. What this is showing is um, a fairly complex habitat. Um, my guess is that this was a restoration site. My guess is that this channel on the right side, I'm just assuming everybody can see my cursor. This channel on the right side was originally probably the main, the main channel. And then through restoration, things got diverted over to the left side. What this has created, instead of just a single channel, big, deep, simplified system, um, now we have basically a swamp or slough um, where this old channel exists. We've got main channel, channel habitat, which is, includes fast and slow water units. Uh, we've got off-channel habitats, so like these little alcoves here and there and everywhere. Um, overall, like quite a bit of diversity. As the water rises and drops, um, all of this vegetation along the banks is going to play a, a key role. For, for fish and for fish habitat. Um, it's gonna provide fish with the, with the habitat that they need to live out their certain uh, life history. Um, 
phases. So overall, this is this is what we should be looking at. We live in the Willamette. It's a low gradient system that we're talking about for the most part. Um, and this is this this braided um, alluvial braided classic channel is, is really what we should be seeing. So this is where I'm going to transition. I want to talk more about Elijah Bristow and how it sort of chalks up to all of this stuff I've been talking about, habitat and fish. Well, inevitably, I've got to talk a little bit about dams um, because that's, that's what's um, influencing the changes in the habitat that we're seeing. This isn't a natural system. We're not seeing natural flood events. Um, we're seeing uh, an altered ecosystem that's largely impacted being created at this point by, by the management of the dams. Elijah Bristow is also, I would say, at, le at, at, at least moderately uh, impacted by human uh, activities. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly within the Elijah Bristow State Park area. So, you know, we've got a lot of people out there hiking and uh, riding horses, recreating, there's picnic areas, all kinds of things going on that's, um, you know, impacting those, that, that habitat. Overall, my take of Elijah Bristow compared to, you know, all of the other places that we monitor in the Willamette, I think it actually has relatively good off-channel habitats currently. Um, you'll see that it has pretty good fish assemblages and, and everything. So overall, you know, I, I give it a B probably uh, as, as far as comparing it to other places uh, throughout the, the throughout the, the Willamette River Basin. That said, um, there's very little off-channel habitat being replaced naturally. And again, that's due to um, the dams. It's due to um, a loss of the natural process that should be happening um, in a river that's undammed. This is the this is the study area that I'm going to focus on. Um, this is Elijah Bristow State Park. Basically, everything. It's nice that they they included the vault toilets in the in the Google image. Uh, but this is Dexter Dam on the on the lower right corner. And then moving downstream, we have a number of sites. I, I pulled these ones specifically because I have annual data on these. Um, and I don't quite get to the west end of the park here i don't think i think we're just shy of that but the lost creek confluence is very near that and it's just going to meander just out of the photo here but there's six sites that i'm going to talk in a, in a little more detail about specifically about the fish that we find there and um just visually how those habitats have changed over time Again, these are the, the, I'm going to talk a little bit more about fish, not much. Um, these are the fish that we've actually found. The sites that I'm going to talk about, um, we've mainly been looking at uh, 2009 data through 2020. Um, over the years, these are the fish species that we've encountered. Um, and then use these numbers with caution. Um, some of these fish have been lumped. So, for instance, um, let's see here. In the non-natives, um, bullhead have been lumped. We have two species that we regularly come across, brown and yellow bullhead. In our data set, we've lumped those. So this is sort of a deflated number, potentially. There's also a couple of native fish. So sculpin, for instance, we, we lump those species. And I feel like there's more, but that's, oh, and then in the non-natives, it's crappie as well. We have uh, black and white crappie present. So again, these numbers aren't exact. But roughly 24 species have been observed. Um, eight of those are non-native and 16 native throughout this time period that I'm going to continue to talk about, 2009 through 2020. So starting at the, the upstream end of, of the study area that I already showed you, uh, the first site you're going to come to, which is just below the dam, just a few hundred yards below the dam, is Dexter Dam Slough. I'm going to show you some before and after photos, but I also I want to point out another word of caution here. Um, some of the changes you're going to see um, are seasonal not necessarily what I would consider to be a 
uh, change due to time. So this, this picture, for instance, I would have to look back at the dates, but it looks to me like this was probably early summer on the left in 2010 and probably later summer on the right, which would explain why there's a little more aquatic vegetation. Um, we've also been stomping around in the water here sampling. So um, with a word of caution, some of these sites, and I'm gonna point that out as we go, I don't think there's quite as much change happening as you might think or as, as, as it might look. I did my best to do side-by-side -side pictures looking at pretty much the same image, um, but we'll also be looking at slightly different angles on occasion. And so again, I'll point that out. But yeah, this is Dexter Dam Slough. Um, my takeaway looking at this is that there really isn't a lot of change for an 11 year period. Yeah, the water is a little lower here, but I think that's probably due to dam releases and seasonality. The site itself hasn't changed a lot. We're a little bit closer in this image on the right. So it kind of looks like the habitat may have shrunk, but that's because we, we just needed to stand back a little bit. Overall, the, uh, the site hasn't changed much. The surface area or total area of the site hasn't changed much. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about fish. Um, and this is gonna be the same thing. The following five slides is gonna look a lot like this. So once I explain these charts once, hopefully it'll be easier to follow along. Um, so these, these visuals are representative of fish. I have Oregon chub, well, first of all, on the x-axis, we've got years, so 2009 through 2020. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at total fish counts. Oregon chub are represented in on the blue, in blue. And then, um, and you can use the y-axis for that. And then um, total fish counts at the sites. I, I say counts, but these are actually total fish estimates. So this should be a, a pretty ac fairly accurate estimate of the total fish at the site, which includes natives and non-natives, um, is, in, is in gray and it's the line here. And then um, this orange represents species, species richness. And for this, you have to ignore this y-axis and just look at the numbers. That's why I have these labeled. Um, I kind of cheated when I created the graph. I took the numbers and I multiplied them by 100 in order to make it so that it was representative and that it would, it would look right for, for representation purposes. But overall, I just want the takeaway being these numbers. So this is what we're seeing at Dexter Dam. Oregon chub populations um, have gone up and down. Um, they peaked here in 2014. It's pretty normal that Oregon chub populations fluctuate quite a bit. Um, as with most species. So yeah, this, this gray line, which represents all fish species, again, it's going up and down. That's, that's representative of probably a lot of things. It's, 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 it's hard to wrap it all into, a, or blame it all on one thing. Um, we've had drought years. We've had changes in dam management. Um, we've had non-native fish move in and out of the sites. There's just a lot of con contributing factors that, that are uh, pretty complex to explain. But again, uh, species richness, is, which again is what I have in yellow here, and it's represented in these numbers. This is the total number of, of different types of species present at the sites on those years. Again, it goes up and down, uh, maybe a slight rise at times and maybe, maybe trending in that direction, but nothing clear. And then because I knew some of you would be really interested in how that translates to natives versus non-natives. Um, the graph on the right is a representative of the proportion of the total fish that were non-native found at the site. I kind of give a little bit away here. This is by far the largest numbers of non-native fish that we're gonna see at any of the sites. Uh, in 2010, for instance, we're looking at about 77, 78% being non-native. And again, this goes up and down a lot. Um, but this is a unique site that we do have some fairly high numbers at times. I think this is representative of this being close to the dam. I think both native and non-native fish have a tendency to sort of migrate up and down the river. And for fish species, non-natives particularly, I would say, that are moving up the system, when they come to that dam, they, they, they meet a, a, a wall, right, that they can't pass. And then this is the, the closest habitat that is probably adequate for them. So depending upon the time that we visit the site, 
I think non-native fish, specifically at this site, it's usually either common carp or bullhead. They move in in these big numbers. And uh, again, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but that's, that's sort of an explanation as to what we're seeing here, where we have these really big proportions of non-native fish at this site. Uh, moving downstream is Elijah Bristow South Slough. Again, we have an image of 2011 on the left and then 2021 on the right. So a 10 year period difference. The angle is slightly different, but you can see that this is the same site. You can look at this power line here. That's a good indicator of what you're looking at. This tree is the same tree as this tree. Um, so in 2011, we're just a little further back. And then our view in 2021 is just a little closer. Again, my takeaway is that, you know, this habitat hasn't changed dramatically. You do see some changes on the right, on this, on the right bank um, where some of the vegetation is lost. The explanation for that, that is that there was actually some clearing um, of the power lines. So that's not necessarily a nat natural process that took place there. But then actually overall, that's, that's sprung back pretty, pretty thick in just a few years time. So yeah, my overall uh, is that there really isn't a lot of habitat loss um, as far as surface area and availability. And then moving on, uh, we're talking about fish again. Again, I already explained this. It looks like uh, Oregon chub, you know, it's ups and downs. In 2009, their population was somewhere around 800 fish. They then peaked in 2015 to around 1,500 fish and then have gone down again. Pretty normal for Oregon chub and pretty normal for other fish species. It's the same thing you can see is true with the total fish, which is represented in gray. It's just up and down. And then the species, species richness, again, this is how many species we found present at the site on that given year. Relatively unchanged. There are years where we find more than others. Again, this is probably based on seasonality. Um, our timing isn't exactly the same every year, although it's pretty close as far as when we're visiting sites. Um, but, you know, if they do, if we do lose some species, we seem to gain them back the next year. So nothing's really changing significantly. Um, on the right, this is the proportion of non-native fish um, at, at the site. As you can see, quite a bit lower than the last graph that I showed you where we were reaching as much as 80%. Here we're looking at, you know, two and a half percent or less. And this is, this is pretty normal for most of these Elijah Bristow off-channel habitats. Elijah Bristow Northeast Slough. Um, I think we did pretty good on the angle here. Uh, again, not a lot of change. I will say in 2019, there was a high water event, um, which did seem to make some difference. I think it scoured this site some. I think that's when we lost a lot of this. Hoping you guys can see my cursor. There's a little bit of a vegetation that's kind of growing here, a little bit of an island that's growing here in the middle of the channel. It looks like that was kind of pushed out um, and I would suspect that happened in the 2019, spring of 2019, when we had a big high water event. But overall, I would say the habitat hasn't changed a lot. Um, it's still roughly the same amount of available uh, habitat for fish. Uh, the same, same vegetation for the most part. Um, we have seen some changes in, in um, the bathymetry of the site where Places that were deeper have shallowed up some, and then other places that were shallow have deep, deepened a little. So minor changes over time. Again, Oregon chub numbers go up and down, as do uh, all, all fish, total fish counts have just gone up and down quite a bit over the years. Species richness has stayed virtually the same, somewhere between five and seven different species that we find at this site. And then non-native fish are, again, a pretty low percentage of our catch, uh, the, the peak being just over 6% in 2018. So pretty low known numbers of non-native fish relative to the abundance of, 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 of native fish. This is Elijah Bristol Island Pond. I didn't label it correctly. Um, this is a... a, a a remnant of gravel operations on the Middle Fork Willamette. 
Um, it's right in the middle of the river, basically on an island or within an island. It's a huge site, it's pretty big. Um, again, 2011 to 2021, I'm not noticing a lot of change. Um, move on to our graphs here. Uh, Chub populations have fluctuated, uh, up and downs, but again, when they go down, they come back up. Um, total fish species, have, it's done the same, ups and downs, maybe an upwards trend slightly. Um, and then the proportion of non-native fish has been relatively low, under 2% always. Um, and again, this isn't the this isn't the proportion of na non-natives to natives. This 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 is the total per, this is the percent of total fish catch of non-natives. So while there may be quite a few different fish species being caught that are non-native, this is just the proportion of the total fish caught that are non-native. Moving on, another habitat is Elijah Bristo gravel pit. This one is kind of an outlier. Um, while I don't feel that the habitat has changed greatly, there has been some difference, some changes in the connectivity at this site. I think there's a little more upstream flow that's been happening. Again, I, I have only been around for so long. So visually, I've only seen this since 2017. But even since I've been around, I've seen there's uh, an increase in the upstream uh, feed or uh, upstream connection to the river. I don't know if that's the explanation to why things have changed a little bit over time or not, or if this, this site has just been moving through stages of succession and it's just become an ideal habitat. But we definitely have seen um, or both Oregon chub and total numbers of fish over time have increased at this site. I think it's just kind of come into uh, ideal conditions for whatever reason. Um, Species richness has also increased some. It really increased between 2009 to 2012, and then it's maintained basically after that. Something interesting about this site is our initial findings were that um, the percent of fish we caught there were, were, were mainly non-native, uh, or the, the, the non-native percentage of catch was really high. I'm hoping I'm, I'm wording this all right. Um, and then over time, that's actually dropped. The proportion of non-native fish, uh, the total proportion of non-native fish to, to native fish has, has declined quite a bit. And then we see a little bit of a jump in 2020, but um, who knows what's exactly going on. Then the last habitat I wanna talk about, and <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk too much about this one. I actually didn't include any graphs for this site. This is Elijah Bristol Berry Slough. Um, it's probably the easiest site for somebody visiting Elijah Bristow to view. This is the upper portion of a slough. It's, it's the most disconnected habitat of any that I'm sharing with you today. Um, in recent years, it's actually desiccated or dried up in, in the summer months. Um, not every summer, but it, it does occasionally. Again, it's the most disconnected. And in my mind, this is sort of the, the, the the habitat that I'm presenting, this is the most um, furthest into the successional stages of an off-channel habitat, meaning that it's kind of disappearing. You know, this, this habitat is, uh, is definitely being, being lost. Um, as you move down the slough, because it doesn't get a lot, of, uh, a lot of flow, a lot of inflow from the river, either upstream or downstream, vegetation has really dominated this site. When you have a lot of vegetation, whether it be native or non-native, specifically non-native, um, or especially non-native, um, you can quicken that rate of succession, succession being the rate at which a site is changing. Um, uh, so what's happening is, you know, it's growing a lot of aquatic vegetation. A lot of that is decomposing, turning into uh, uh, detritus at the bottom of the slough. And then there's no flow to push that out. So it's just sort of slowly filling in. But this site, I would say, while the other sites are not changing too, too much, um, this, this one definitely is in a later stage. And therefore, visually, it's more obvious that the habitat is, is kind of going away. 
Um, so this, I'm kind of cheating here. Um, I took a visual from uh, another talk. This is South Staten Pond. This is not the Middle Fork Willamette or uh, representative of Elijah Bristow. Um, but what we have, I do think this is a good representative of what we see up across sites um, all over the place. And so it is it is a good representative, but it's not one of the sites we're looking at at Elijah Bristow. So at the bottom, these are different species of fish. Um, sorry that they're not clear on what they are, um, but we did throw some labels in here. What's pretty normal at a site over time is that we see huge changes in fish community and fish assemblage um, even on a year-to-year -year basis. So this is pretty good representative. This is pretty extreme I would say but it's pretty normal if you look across sites. So you can see here in 2009 not a lot of fish present. Um, there's a few different species. 2010 it goes down to it looks like probably just two species and even fewer fish and then we have this explosion in 2011. Um, mainly stickleback it was dominated um, with some other species, red-sided shiners, um, a few sculpin, some speckled dace. The following year, for whatever reason, speckled dace seemed to take the lead and stickleback kind of slowed down. Uh, chub are coming into the scene here. They're on the increase. In 2013, they're the dominant fish. And then it looks like we have this, this you know, basically a, a, a collapse of a lot of non-native fish in 2014. And then 2015, moving forward, we have this really dominant uh, bluegill invasion. So, I mean, explaining this is pretty difficult. Uh, I would, I will say, it's it's pretty normal throughout uh, Oregon chub sites and throughout floodplain sites that we're we're monitoring. Um, but fish numbers go up and down. Fish assemblage changes over time. In explanation of you know, what I've been talking about. I started talking a little bit about succession, about habitat needs, um, about the ultimate loss of off-channel habitats due to dam operations. This is an image that sort of sums that up. Um, this is showing um, from Harrisburg on the, on the main stem Willamette to the mouth of the Mackenzie River. This is showing the reduction in shoreline habitat or basically it's showing the reduction in complexity of, of, of aquatic habitat, um, especially in off-channel habitats along the main stem Willamette. Uh, this is on the left, it's 1854, and on the right, we're looking at 1967. Pretty dramatic image here. Um, and then moving on, uh, because I know some people might wanna see an actual overhead photo it's a little less obvious because there's a little more going on in this image. Um, but again, you're going to see loss of off-channel habitats, of secondary channels, of uh, many slow-moving unit type habitats. Again, we talked about um, how important diversity and complexity is in a, in a river system. Um, over time, we're seeing a, a, a change, a reduction in that. I'm for some reason unable to, oh, there we go. Um, this, this is a, a little more recent history. This is 1936 to 2011. And <clears throat> I still think the, the, the changes that you see are pretty dramatic. I'm gonna point out with my cursor, for instance, like this was a secondary channel. It, it, I mean, this is pretty, providing a ton of habitat, um, would have been providing a ton of habitat for for fish that, that, that need something other than main channel type habitat, it's essentially lost. Um, you know, from 1936 to 2011, it's essentially lost. And you'll see that all over the place up here. You'll see occasionally there's a place where some, some off-channel habitat is gained or created, um, but by far it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a loss of habitat. So this is another, this little off-channel habitat here, which connects upstream and downstream and onto another secondary. It's essentially gone in 2011. So again, this is due to um, a loss of flow regime, uh, natural flows that would happen without dams. Um, with dams, we have a reduction in seasonality. We have a reduction in high water events, which are responsible for creating these habitats. And therefore, you know, we, we see a reduction in, in, in the total amount of this habitat over time.
I have one more image for you just to, 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 to nail it home. Um, this is, a, this is a, an image of, this is the Portland area actually. So the, the, the lower Willamette is on the left here coming into the Columbia. This is 1888 image versus 2001 image. I mean, for obviously re obvious reasons, um, you know, there was a lot of development, a lot of uh, commercial development and, and housing and farming, all kinds of things were happening here. But ultimately, you see a huge reduction in off-channel habitats and in, in, in complexity. A lot of these pools that were left or that were between the Willamette and the Columbia um, were ultimately lost, either diverted to the main river, or diverted into sewers, or diverted to uh, a more simplified slough and pond system. And again, this is just something that's been happening throughout the entire Willamette. And, um, you know, while we don't see it so much happening in Elijah Bristow too, too, too much, um, because like I said, it's in relatively good shape. This, this, this is ultimately what's happening slowly over time. So some takeaways, um, because I am coming to the end of my talk. Um, again, I think Elijah Bristow contains relatively good fish habitat, and that's represented in the fish numbers that I showed you. It has um, a diverse species composition, quite a few different species that are present, mainly native fish, at least in, 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 in big numbers. Uh, fish communities are diverse and dynamic, and, and they're also changing. So that's that's normal. That's something we expect when, when habitat changes. Uh, over time, fish communities are going to change, um, but oftentimes they kind of come back to to what they where they started at some point. Um, habitat complexity is key to diverse fish assemblages. I think I've said that multiple times. Um, without the uh, the natural systems, uh, we're losing that complexity, and um, it's kind of a bummer. Uh, not only are we, we we're losing the existing sites, but, but we've, we've lost the process that's creating new off-channel habitats. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the off-channel habitats that we're seeing at Elijah Bristow that, that are still providing pretty good habitat, my takeaway on the, on the photos is that things aren't changing too much. And that's because those off-channel habitats have, I put in quotes here, they've stabilized. Um, there's nothing really changing them dramatically. They are connected to the rivers, so they still have some, some connection. Um, fish are still getting in and out. Um, there's no big flow events that are, that are altering them or changing them which in a way is a good thing, but the problem is that we're not gaining any new off-channel habitats other places. And so, um, you know, that, that slowed succession, and I put this in parentheses with an asterisk because I think some people are gonna say, wait a minute, you're slowing succession? I think that's true. I think, I think you're, uh, because you're stabilizing these sites, the succession of these sites, they're actually being lost at maybe a slower pace but you're also not replacing them. So when they are ultimately at some point lost due to, to succession, maybe it's slow, but eventually they will be lost. The habitats are not being replaced. So that really is the problem. Um, and that was my next bullet point. And so this is again, my pitch for um, me believing that, you know, restoration work is really important. If we're not gonna remove dams, um, we'll have to do other things to create off-channel habitats, to create new off-channel habitats and maybe maintain the ones that we do have. So again, I wanna give acknowledgements to all the folks who have been a part of this project. I'm just one guy that came in kind of at the end. <clears throat> There's been a lot of people who have done a lot of work and who are responsible for not only the recovery of Oregon chub, but for enhancing habitats all over the place for a lot of different types of fish. And that work continues. That's the end of the talk. And so I would like to uh, invite questions or discussion. Um, hey, Gail. Hey, thanks so much, Matt. That was a lot of information. We got some good questions coming into um, in our Q&A and chat. So I'm just gonna pull this up, excuse me, as I read my screen. Um, we had some fish questions that I might start off with. So you, 
Uh, one of the questions was the names of the non-native fish, and you you brought up that list a little bit later on in the talk after this question was answered. But I'm kind of curious: are there any non-native fish that are a particular threat, or something that you really are keeping an eye on um, in terms of their populations? Um, yeah. So sorry about that. I didn't really get into specifics on on many of those fish. Um, the larger predatory sunfish. Um, are absolutely a concern. So largemouth bass, um, even bluegill, we've got um, not really pumpkin, seed ne pumpkin seeds necessarily in this area, um, but there are some others, including, um, I think I may have mentioned that there's one new sunfish that's moved in um, to the Willamette River Basin. I say moved in, um, I don't know, know necessarily that it's moved in or if there was just misidentification early on in the project. But green sunfish is one that we are keeping a close eye on. Um, they have a tendency to become super, super fecund or super uh, abundant at sites. Um, they're definitely highly predatory. In places where they are coexisting with Oregon chub, we are seeing some negative, um, some negative effects on the chub populations. Other places, they seem to be coexisting. So it's kind of difficult to know exactly what it means when, it, when a green sunfish is, it moves into a site and is found. But overall, um, I would say, yeah, those larger sunfish, because they have a larger mouth and larger, uh, they, larger gape, um, they're more easily able to eat these smaller minnow species, these, these native minnows. Um, another one that um, I think initially there was probably more concern for. Um, I'm not saying I'm not concerned, but at this point, they're so widespread and they seem to be coexisting with Oregon chub in so many places, is the western mosquito fish. Uh, the problem with them is not necessarily that they're predatory. They're a, they're a really small fish. They're about the same size as an Oregon chub, but that they're, they are highly aggressive. They prefer the same type of habitats. They, they, they like slow moving water. They like a lot of aquatic vegetation. And um, so they're pushing Oregon chub out of probably the, their ideal habitats. That said, they seem to coexist decently in places. They probably affect them more in some places than others. But I would say those are, those are probably the main concerned fish that we're looking at. Yeah, and then a follow-up question to that is, how were these introduced? Do you have any concept of how, in general, they're introduced? Yeah, so um, a lot of the sunfish that you see in the Willamette <clears throat> were unfortunately introduced by the state in the early 1900s into the lower Willamette. Um, they brought them from the East Coast, Midwest, um, as a... Uh, you know, as a fun fish to catch. They put them in there for, my understanding is there was a big event on the Willamette. And uh, that's, that's where most of them stemmed from as far as the sunfish goes. Absolutely, bucket biologists have, have been, have probably played a, a role in that. People move fish around all the time. I say bucket biologists. What I mean by that is people who are, you know, interested in fisheries. They maybe fish a bunch. Uh, they just really like bass. They think they're really cool. And they'll catch them maybe in the main stem Willamette and then move them up into a off-channel habitat or an isolated pond somewhere. It happens all the time. Um, and then the same thing goes for, I mean, I would say all fish, but the same thing goes for Western mosquito fish. Um, they were initially put in, introduced by mostly private landowners, I believe, um, as a prey item for other, other fish that were introduced into ponds. So Let's say, for instance, you have largemouth bass and you want to bolster the population of largemouth bass. Well, they have to eat something. Um, Western mosquito fish have definitely been used for that purpose. They've also been used because of the name. Um, people consider them uh, uh, a fish species that's particularly good at controlling mosquito numbers. So when you have a pond somewhere, let's say that, and you have really bad mosquito issues, you're looking for some kind of fish that might help you out and eat those larval, those larval mosquitoes. Well, mosquito fish, has, they've been that fish that everybody considers to be the solution. It's unfortunate because we have these floodplain minnows such as, you know, Oregon chub, uh, speckled dace, red side shiner, 
all of these fish would play the same role. They, would, they could be used for the same purposes. Um, but Western mosquito fish, because of the name, seem to, seem to be the one that gets used more often than not. Um, and then a little bit of follow up to, to what you mentioned about people bringing them in for, for sport. Are, is there any sport fishing around, like especially the bass, but or any encouragement by the state for folks to, to catch these invasive fishes, fish? Yeah, um, sort of. Um, there has been a, a loosening of, of like uh, fishing restrictions for non-native fish. Um, so, you know, for instance, for, for bass and another species that I didn't even mention yet um, is walleye, generally because you're only going to catch those like in the lower, lower Willamette. And then actually up in Lookout Point um, and Dexter Reservoir, there's, there's walleye. We don't seem to catch those in the Middle Fork Willamette or downstream too much. I don't know why that is because they are above and below. Um, but for species like that, they've taken off restrictions on fishing. So instead of only allowing you five or seven or whatever they used to allow per day as a, as a recreational fish species, they've kind of labeled them as, as a, a, an enemy of the state and you can go out and catch as many as you want. So I think that's the, that's the idea behind those, those regulation changes. Whether or not it's, it's making a big impact or not, it's kind of yet to be seen. Sure. Um, and then one last uh, fish question, at least for now. Um, this one came in, bluegill and sunfish usually propagate in still lake habitat. What are they doing in running water habitat? Um, so we mainly sample still water habitats. So we're looking at off-channel habitats, places that are ideal for those species. That said, we do sample in some main stem habitats, some moving moving water. Um, absolutely, like those those species definitely prefer still water and lots of vegetation. Um, the same kind of things that Oregon chub prefer. Um, but we actually do find them. You'd be surprised. We find them in places um, that you wouldn't consider to be ideal habitat. Same with all species, right? So. There's certain places where things thrive, and then there's other places, there's certain places where things exist. And so we find, uh, we find sunfish, bluegill, pumpkin seed, whatever. We find those in some slightly, I mean, I would say slow moving water, water habitats. Um, if we were in a, a main stem habitat, which I, I have sampled some, which, um, you know, is maybe a, a mix of riffles and pools, but it's still on a main stem river, it's not offset from the main channel. We still find those species. We just tend to find them more on, along the margins where there may be some overhanging vegetation or, uh, or aquatic vegetation um, or even just overhanging banks, things like that. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, um, focus on areas like that instead of, you know, obviously living out in the current in, in a riffle. Um, so they're found everywhere. <laughs> they're, they're adaptive. Um, Somewhat. So switching gears a little bit, uh, this question came in, how have recent fires impacted chub population? And I would maybe expand that to other like native fish populations if you've seen an impact. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, not many of our sites are in areas that were impacted by fire. Um, and I, at this point, haven't noticed any uh, downstream effects. Um, I think the biggest reason is because we are below dams, and so we're not seeing some of those effects that may be happening upstream of the dams that are coming down from those burns. Um, that said, in, in 2022, there are a couple of sites, I believe, maybe a few sites we will be monitoring that, that I think were affected by fires. Like, I haven't been there yet. Um, I haven't looked at them, so I don't really have an answer for that. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Stay tuned for future <laughs> research. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then um, kind of a bigger picture pulling back a little bit, what would be the single most important takeaway you would want a conservationist to know about Chubb and the Middle Fork Willamette? And what is one thing that community members can do for Chubb? 
Can you repeat one time? I, I had a little cutout in the audio. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the two part question, one is like, what what do you see as like the, the single um, most important takeaway you would want a conservationist to know about Chubb and the Middle Fork? Okay. I'll start with that and then if you yeah, can read the I'll second. follow up with a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think as, as I mentioned before, um, the Middle Fork Willamette, specifically the Elijah Bristow area is in pretty good shape, really. Um, compared to a lot of other places that we sample for Oregon chub, um, it's still a fairly diverse and complex system. It has a lot of these ideal habitats for off-channel fish. Um, but that said, you know, I think we are on a direction or we were headed in a direction where we're only going to see the loss of that habitat unless we do something about it. So this whole talk, I didn't necessarily initially intend this to be a restoration talk, um, but inevitably when you start talking about this habitat being just below a dam, being highly influenced by dam operations, and you're talking about fish assemblage, you're absolutely going to see change over time in a negative direction, usually, generally speaking, um, where you're going to see a loss of that ideal habitat. So, you know, for folks who are worried about Oregon chub and who want to make sure that the spe species continues to do well over time, um, I think I would probably push for um, habitat improvement. Um, I think, and that's probably going to have to be done through restoration. What that looks like, I'm not a restoration biologist and I'm not a hydrologist. Um, but I do know that these fish require, you know, dynamic complex systems. And if that's being lost, we need to find a way in order to create it. Yeah, and the follow-up question to that is, is there one thing that a community member could do for Chubb to help Chubb? Huh. I mean, I think just making yourself knowledgeable, um, I think something that, is probably new to a lot of folks that I would present this talk to is the sheer number of fish species that are out there. Um, Oregon chub just being one of them. Um, if you're worried about fish and you're worried about native fish, you know, I think just spreading, spreading some knowledge is really important. I can't tell you how many people I run into that just don't even know what an Oregon chub is, which is surprising to me because it's a, it's a species, it's probably like the most um, probably the most famous of the minnow, like native off-channel habitat fish in the Willamette. Um, maybe second to the northern pike minnow because that gets a bad rep. But um, for having so much exposure and being on the news through the years for its delisting and recovery and all of that stuff, I'm still surprised how many people I run into who just don't have a clue about the species. They don't have a clue about any of the species needs or the life history. And so um, I think just spreading some knowledge on the species is probably the most influential thing you can do. You can always share this talk because we'll share it out as we're recording yeah. later. So oh, <laughs> no. All your friends. <laughs> and I'm going to put a link in the chat box too for our Elijah Bristow page on our website that's looking forward to some, some possible restoration that's going to happen in this area. Uh, and some of you may already be familiar with it. Um, but we do have that coming up. And we have Kavoka Jackson here, who's our restoration projects manager. So if you have any specific questions around the restoration piece, we're happy to answer those too. Um, and we are um, really focusing on community engagement with this. So this is just one piece of it. We'll have a lot more events coming up, especially this spring and summer. Um, if this piques your interest and you want to learn more about the restoration uh, and what we, we have going on around that and how you can be involved in helping form how we're gonna do the restoration um, and, and what that's gonna look like in our park. Um, so it looks like, I think we got through all the questions that we have in the chat box here. If there's any final questions anybody has, feel free to pop those in. Um, and if not, I 
you can always email myself, um, all these links um, that I'll put in the chat box and all of our contact information for the Middle Fork team um, will be in the follow-up email that you'll get from us. Uh, so if you think of any questions later on that you uh, didn't come up during the, the presentation tonight, we welcome you to, to throw those in there um, in an email to us and we can get them to either Kavoka or Matthew or um, whoever is the best person to answer those questions. So don't feel this is your last chance to ask. Uh, we are happy to take those at any time. Yeah, on, on that note, Gail, I just wanted to kind of a follow up to that last question about, you know, what can I do uh, for Oregon Chaba for native fish? My, my cell phone number is here and I totally invite people if they have any ideas or, you know, have questions or whatever, feel free to call me. I'm telling you, like a lot of the success of this project has been folks like them who just want to make a positive change and they call the project and it just so happens that, that if they know the right person or we know the right people, we can connect people um, and we can make things happen. So um, please reach out if you have any concerns or questions or ideas. Perfect. Excellent. Um, well, unless I see any last questions pop up here, um, double check here. We're on. Um, but yeah, it looks like we've got all those questions there answered that we've seen. So like I said, feel free to shoot, shoot us those emails or uh, Matthew's information is up there as well. And I just really wanted to thank Matthew tonight for this talk. Um, it's uh, wonderful to hear about the chub and about how Things have changed and stayed the same at Elijah Bristow over time. I think that's really important to understand that there's, you know, there's there's good change and there's bad change, and it's nice to hear that there's a little bit of both. Um, and we wanted to thank all of you for showing up tonight. It's a beautiful night out tonight, so thanks so much for sharing the last hour and a half with us. Um, just as a reminder, I said this before, but we are recording this video, um, so if and we'll be sharing that out with you after the talk. Um, and so if you want to go back and revisit anything from the talk, or if you want to share it with someone you think would enjoy it or could learn a little about our local Fish the Chub, uh, please feel free to share that. If you have any lingering questions, reach out to us or Matthew's information there on the screen, um, and we can pass it along to the correct person or, or Matthew can get back to you. Again, if you enjoyed this talk, um, and would like to see others like it, uh, please consider donating to the Middle Fork. Uh, we always appreciate any size donation. And we really just appreciate you showing up to our events and being here with us. And so thanks so much. Uh, I'll let you get back to the, the, the sunset that's happening outside my window <laughs> and hope you have a wonderful night and thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>